Okay, if I can find the camera there. So welcome everyone to another uh, session of our um, talks here in Porlab. So today we will uh, we have James McClure from uh, Virginia Tech. We will give a talk. So James has uh, oh, yeah, even been to Trondheim, uh, I guess, a couple of times and given us this workshop on the LBBM uh, earlier. So uh, we're very happy to have him back this time online and hopefully in the future in flesh too. And uh, his uh, work is uh, should be very relevant for uh, a lot of people here who is working on similar topics. So uh, please, uh, James, go ahead. Thank you. It's always a pleasure to interact with the Poor Lab group. I have a really high regard for the work that you do, so it's always it's always a pleasure to you know be able to to hear from you and and get your feedback on on things that are happening and things that you're doing. So. So, um, oh, now it's not letting me advance. Okay, there we go. So the main uh, topic for this talk uh, is going to be to develop a strategy to derive the relative permeability for two fluid flow using time and space averaging. Um, and, and the main motivation from this is due to the issues created by geometric discontinuities when you have topological changes. Um, and this uh, really creates problems because if you if you can't take a derivative, certain kinds of theoretical approaches you know are off the table. So we, we started worrying about this and say, how do we deal with this? Um, and this actually gives some framework to understand what kind of couplings can occur between thermodynamic and mechanical flu uh, fluctuations when you have uh, systems that you're subdividing. Um, this directly relates to the validity of the ergodic hypothesis, particularly in big systems. So I'm going to spend a bit of time talking about how do we deal with ergodicity, and in particular, uh, how do we deal with ergodicity sort of at finite time scales, and what do we do if the system isn't ergodic, you know, at some scale. Um, so the multi-scale averaging framework that will be developed is uh, really this integrating uh, systems in time and space as a way to homogenize systems with slow fluctuations. And then based on this, there's a link to REV systems. You know, can we use this kind of theory to make more precise statements about the linkage between spatial and temporal scales in a system? So the, the geometric picture you know, that really drives this is based on the Minkowski functionals, which I, I know a, a, a number of you are already familiar with it. Normally I wouldn't jump right into it, but with this group, I feel like, I feel like you'll be, uh, I'd be beating a dead horse if I talked about it because I think many of you already, you know, are really very familiar uh, with, with work in this area. Uh, but the basic idea is that you can describe the average geometry of a structure with geometric invariance, uh, which is this volume, the surface area, the integral mean curvature, and the Euler characteristic. And you can essentially remove capillary pressure hysteresis based on this geometric description. But when we add time, it creates a problem because topological changes are inherently discontinuous. And this means you can't predict when these changes will happen from differential geometry. So you have to have essentially some other tools because topological changes are really common. And they also have an impact on the physics because they create these local shocks. So here you see what happens to the other characteristic for just a little system you know, in a couple of pores where you have loops forming and you see that you get a step function. Every time a loop forms, it jumps by an integer value because topology is, you know, a discrete thing. So this example shows what's really the simplest topological change in fluid mechanics, which is droplet coalescence. And, and what we're going to see is that when you have two droplets co coalesce, you have capillary fluxions that arise. So if you look right where those two droplets touch, as soon as they go, there's a shock that forms. And then it takes quite a bit of time for this system to reach a new uh, equilibrium. And it's going through different scaling regimes as it goes, and it sort of uh, basically oscillates back and forth. And this happens because of the uh, force imbalance that happens right away as soon as the droplets coalesce. Uh, so they really haven't... Uh, had any time to sort of mix information together. And the time scale for the non-equilibrium response is going to depend on the length scales for heterogeneity in the system. So if we look at what this, uh, you know, what these dynamics would look like, 
Um, and I'll talk about how I get to this uh, equation here, but this is just looking at the pressure fluctuations in the, in the fluids and the surface area changes. And, and the graph is showing what the pressure fluctuations are doing. You can see there's almost perfect symmetry between what's happening in the droplet and what's happening in the surrounding fluid. That is, there's, you know, and this is based on conservation energy and based on the fact that one fluid is pushing against the other. So there's a sort of built-in symmetry. And um, this is really significant amount of energy that's going into these fluctuations compared to the amount of pressure volume work in, in the system and the, and the dissipation for that matter. <clears throat> so this tells us uh, you know, some, some sort of interesting challenges with, with geometry that we have to deal with. And uh, the challenge of a discontinuity in particular is something that troubled us because we know that um, at, at the molecular level, the Hamiltonian is smooth. So how do you get a discontinuity into the physical representation? And the, the conclusion that we reached is that geometry is really something that you introduce into the system because you're making this choice to put a Gibbs dividing surface in there. And this is not going to be an intrinsic property of the system. It's a, it's a modeling choice. So it's actually a question of the representation introducing discontinuities into a system, even though you have some underlying smoothness there. And that's why these symmetry properties come out. And so we need to think of geometric representation as being a tool to deal with length and time scale separation and not lose sight of that, in particularly um, with, relate to, with, with relationship to global symmetry properties, uh, because conservation of energy applies to the whole system, and, and if you just look at individual phases, you end up having to do more bookkeeping than if you look at the system as a whole. Uh, so, so that sort of drives some of our choices, like when do we want to subdivide a model and, and, and how does it affect our ability to sort of move that model forward? So the, the reason that this connects to ergodicity is that when you have energy barriers in a system, they can prevent mixing from occurring. So the, the history of ergodic theory, which is the foundation of statistical mechanics, really uh, began with Boltzmann's statistical definition of entropy um, and, and Gibbs' um, formulation of statistical mechanics based on ensemble averaging. Uh, the formal mathematical theory um, is usually attributed to von Neumann uh, for a paper published in the 1930s where there was a formal uh, sort of representation of ergodic behavior in the limit of infinite time. If you look at linear response theory, which is, you know, if you want to derive transport equations, um, there are links to, you know, most of the major theories depend explicitly on ergodic behavior. So this would be the ensemble reciprocal late relations, the fluctuation dissipation theorem, the green kubo relations. All of these results apply to stationary processes in an ergodic system. So if we lose our ergodicity, we're sort of operating almost without a base for a lot of, uh, for a lot of thermodynamics. At the same time, there's a lot of work uh, on non-ergodic systems, and, and there are significant questions about how long is long enough. Obviously, infinite time scale is impractical for many of the problems that we care about. And uh, people are aware of many important classes of systems that have at least been identified as non-ergodic. Now, there's a little bit of imprecision here. So when I started looking into this ergodicity question, um, which uh, you know, up until a couple of years ago, I hadn't really worked on it. And the ergodic part seemed okay. But what I struggled with was how do you identify a system that's non-ergodic? And there, 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 I think, were some different tests, but it's, it's not really as concrete as, as I would, would, would have liked it to be. So it was a little bit difficult. Um, but what, what these systems have in common is that there's a time scale of interest that's fast, faster than the mixing time scale. So the mixing time scale is important because Basically, the, you know, as molecules bounce around and, and exchange energy, this is what 
is giving rise to equal partition of energy in the system. So if you have things that slow down mixing, like subdiffusion based on energy barriers, then you're going to end up delaying the rate of mixing in the system. So what do we do if the ergodic hypothesis doesn't hold? So first, you know, based on this idea that mixing is the mechanism that leads to energy, uh, we need to identify the length and time scales that we care about. Uh, that is, what is our scale of interest? What do we take? What is the scale we take measurements at? And and can we estimate based on the time scale the the, the spatial scale at which the system is well mixed? Second, if we have an ergodic system, spatial, temporal, and ensemble averages are equivalent. So you can do volume averaging, or you can do time averaging, or you can do en ensemble averaging, and they should all give you the same answer. And this is maybe the most critical test uh, for ergodicity would be just to compare these averages and see if they would see that they were the same. Now, if you don't have an ergodic system, the conclusion that we reached is that you have to explicitly average the dynamics in space and time. Basically, you take the actual observed dynamics and you just integrate them, and that provides a path forward. Because it doesn't depend on ergodicity, it just depends on your functions being integrable. And then finally, in an ergodic system, the fluctuations have a Gaussian distribution, um, but, but we're going to try to formulate an analysis without making any statistical assumptions about the fluctuations. Um, we're we're going to rely on conservation principles to try to understand what constraints they, they impose. So it's not, you know, this is basically just saying that we're not, this isn't a statistical theory, um, you know, at the scale of at the Darcy scale. So, you know, building on this kind of idea of defining ergodicity at a fixed time scale, suppose that you take a thermometer and you put it into a system, right? And you measure the temperature for some period of time, which is going to be this, uh, this tau m, the diffuse. Uh, given, this, given this time scale, the molecules in the system will sort of bounce around. And from the Einstein relation, we know about how far they move during this length of time. And so, Based on this length scale, we can define a volume where we can say, all right, well, the system is going to be well mixed at this scale, right? As long as it's homogeneous within that region, uh, it should be a reasonable estimate. So we figure out what this length scale is. And, you know, thermodynamics works really well at small length scales. So uh, we can pretty much always define a sufficiently small uh, region where ergodicity will hold. And this means that we'll have a sort of firm base in terms of statistical mechanics, even if that base falls apart at some larger scale. So this provides a way to upscale the dynamics to larger systems without assuming that the systems globally are got it. So coming back to this idea of discontinuities, we already know that a time average can convert a discrete system into a continuous system based on the molecular to continuum perspective, right? Molecular systems are discrete uh, in some sense, and we can get a density from a molecular dynamic simulation by averaging in time or averaging in space. Um, and, you know, time average is, I think, more critical than a spatial average with respect to ergodicity. <clears throat> so um, this basically gives us, you know, a way to move to larger scales where you have geometric discontinuities, right? Because if we average these discontinuities in time, we're going to take that discontinuity and effectively smear it out so that it doesn't look discontinuous anymore. So it's a way to get rid of discrete effects. So now consider a big system with spatial heterogeneity. So this, this uh, green and teal kind of images uh, essentially just showing some system that has some sort of compositional heterogeneity in it. <clears throat> and based on this, the diffusive mixing time scale across the whole region is going to be large due to confinement because that length scale is growing like the, like the square root of the measurement time. So um, it, it's you know, going to uh, take a long time to mix a large system. So we want to avoid this, you know, potentially infinite time scale associated with an ensemble average, particularly when you have these energy barriers that are inhibiting diffusion. 
So the operator that we're going to use to upscale the dynamics is, a, is just an integral in space and time. So here, the, uh, the region omega is just a spatial region, so it'd be like a volume. Uh, and then, uh, you know, that, that's you're sort of defining your, your system of interest, right? So that's the, the region that contains your system of interest. And then capital lambda is going to be the region for time averaging, which has some duration little lambda. So little lambda is just the length uh, of the time window. And then we just, whatever dynamics happen, you know, within that, we're just going to integrate them to come up with some homogenized representation. So the first piece here is the uh, scale consistent thermodynamics um, at an, a point, basically our sort of ergodic scale in the system. We're going to take the Euler equation, uh, just the standard uh, thermodynamic representation that everyone sort of knows and loves, and we're going to build on it from there. So to, to make a scale consistent formulation, we're averaging this uh, over, the, over the larger volume. So if we have an extensive variable, which are the internal energy, the entropy, and the number of molecules in this case, uh, we're just going to add those things up. So we just integrate them so that those properties have the identical meaning across scales, because we don't you know, we can't say, you can't redefine what the number of molecules mean just because we changed the scale of interest for our system, right? And then this constrains the intensive properties as well because we want to make sure, for example, that the amount of thermal energy is the same, you know, independent of the scale. So basically we're gonna make sure that the integral of Ts is equal to the average temperature and the average entropy at the larger scale. <clears throat> and then the, the next piece is the fluxes. And since the, the continuity equation doesn't have any transport coefficients in it, we have to make sure that this representation stays the same as well. So our diffusive fluxes, uh, the momentum, uh, and the entropy flux have to also be just direct integrals uh, of, of the associated quantities on the bottom. So the, you know, the mass flux you know, is going to have a, a scale independent kind of form. Now, if you take this uh, not, you know, the fundamental relation of non-equilibrium thermodynamics and you integrate it um, in a heterogeneous system, you get deviation terms. And these have appeared uh, previously in a lot of volume averaging work, you know, going back to the work of Whitaker and, and Bill Gray and Majid Hazanazada and you know, things that were published in the 80s and 90s for homogenization for flow and porous media, these deviation terms uh, appear in many of these theories. Uh, and they continue to appear. And the way that they're um, dealt with is essentially by assuming the system is ergodic at the large scale. So what we're gonna do is basically say, we're gonna keep them, we're gonna see what they do. So then these are just the deviation, the deviation terms are just the difference between the microscopic value and the average value. So let's consider a, a simple case here, which is the Carnot cycle. So suppose we, we, we just have our regular Carnot cycle, but instead of, you know, sort of considering it as a, as a cycle in the standard way, we're going to integrate the dynamics over the complete cycle time so that we get a constant value for the extensive variable. So we're gonna get an average volume, and an average, uh, or an average volume and an average entropy and an average internal energy. And the dynamics are just gonna cycle around this, right? So we're deviation terms are accounting for essentially all the dynamics of the system. And this essentially makes your Carnot cycle into a fluctuation because the, uh, you, know, you don't have changes in your extensive variables at time, because it's basically now it's a stationary process that we're cycling through. And that means that the energy dynamics are fully described by a relationship between fluctuations. And, and these are gonna be a little bit different than the sort of conventional representation of a fluctuation because they have units of power, right? So instead of just looking at a temperature fluctuation or a, or a, a pressure fluctuation, they're multiplied by the extensive quantities so that you have the units of power for both. And that's where the symmetry is gonna be because when you know, your energy conservation is basically gonna be respected based on 
any energy exchanges between these quantities. And also since energy is an accumulating within the system during the cycle, uh, you, you basically uh, can't get any change in, in, the, in the extensive quantity. So for example, entropy is not increasing in this case where it's going up and down, right? So they all cycle around this average value. So here's your entropy te temperature surface. The entropy is going up and down based on the heat exchanges that are occurring, right? So let's go to a little bit more complicated example so that we can look at subsetting. So this is a very famous example called Maxwell's demon, demon which is a sort of a thermodynamic conundrum. So the idea is that you have a cold chamber and a hot chamber, and in between them, there's a gate that's operated by a demon. And this demon has some way to measure uh, how fast molecules are moving in a way that doesn't require any energy. And if, if it sees a fast molecule, it opens the gate and lets it cross. If it sees a slow molecule, it leaves it closed. And, and the problem this creates is that your molecules can go from the cold chamber to the hot chamber uh, against what would be your sort of thermodynamic intuition, right? And it's doing this simply by exploiting the natural fluctuations in the molecular system. Now, this behavior clearly violates the second law of thermodynamics. You know, so it's, you know, been a, you know, topic of discussion, particularly early in the development of thermodynamics. Uh, so let's look at what this, what happens here if we subset it. So we have these two regions, right? We're going to take our thermal energy. Since it's just an integral in time and space, we can break it up into an integral over the hot region and an integral of the cold region. And we get a uh, representation of the temperature within each of the subregions of the system. <clears throat> and then the entropy and temperature are, are just going to be defined accordingly. So it's taking advantage of the scale consistent representations. And you'll get a consistent representation whether you assume that the total entropy and number of molecules were the state variables, or if you assumed that it was sort of dependent on the state within each of the subchambers. There uh, is an algorithm that we put together uh, that uses Maxwell Boltzmann statistics to simulate Maxwell's steam. So the entropy for an ideal gas can be described by this equation, it's the separate tetrad equation. And so you can just go and derive basically what would happen if you had a demon that would behave in a certain way. So this molecule is just gonna let molecules with a sufficiently high uh, speed cross the gate. So what happens, right? So this is a plot of the entropy. So the black curve is going to be the global entropy. The blue curve is the cold chamber and the red curve is the hot chamber. And because I'm interested in stationary processes, at time equals one second, I'm going to disable the demon just to see what the system does. And it comes right back to its initial state. So even though the, the second law is violated because you have this decrease of entropy that happens at the beginning when the, when the demon starts working, uh, those changes are fully reversible. Basically, what the demon is doing is it's postponing the equilibrium uh, by exploiting the sort of natural fluctuations. Now, what happens to the other variables is really interesting. So if you look at the number of molecules, as this entropy is segregated, you can see that there's more and more molecules popping up in the cold region, right? And there's less and less in the hot region. And then if we look at the pressure, you get a pressure difference across this barrier. So the pressure difference is uh, you know, pretty significant due to the fact that you have more molecules in one chamber compared to the other. And the same is true for the chemical potential. So you get a, 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 a discontinuity in the chemical potential at the barrier. But you don't for the temperature. The temperature, you know, even though it fluctuates away from, uh, you know, away from the sort of mean temperature, it comes right back uh, once the molecules redistribute. So what you're doing is you're segregating the, the entropy and the composition between the chambers. It's not producing a temperature gradient as it would appear in Fourier's law. So it's, 
sort of interesting that it doesn't behave in the way that the example is typically presented. And you can see here that conservation of energy, even though you have the second law violation, the system isn't exchanging any heat with the surroundings. So it's not violating conservation of energy, it's just sort of creating this little entropy dilemma. So this is gonna inform one, you know, I included the example mainly because of the subdivision of the system, but also, you know, in, in certain cases, uh, you, you wonder a little bit about whether or not you can assume that entropy uh, production is always positive. <clears throat> so let's turn now toward the, the sort of main challenge, which is uh, deriving the relative permeability. Um, so in this case, our spatial system is going to be this porous material here. That's going to be our omega. It's just going to be, say, some sample that we might stick in a core holder and run flow experiments through. And, and that will integrate over that to get our uh, space average. And then our time average is just going to be based on uh, however long we need to integrate to you know, get stationary behavior. So our spatial scale is fixed. But if we need to integrate for a longer time scale to see something stationary, then we'll just we'll just wait longer, right? So this is a little bit like you know this fixed time ergodicity thing, right? We're going to wait as long as we need to, uh, based on the system dynamics. So um, for the relative permeability, you get a linear relationship between the pressure gradient and the volumetric flow rate, um, which is you know directly analogous to a flux force pair in, in traditional non-equilibrium theory. So the main questions are, you know, how, how do we define these average quantities and under what conditions is the relationship valid? So that's really what we're trying to do to derive it from first principles. Um, you know, that's the main goal. And the connection to the previous discussion, you know, we clearly have these energy barriers that are present due to capillary forces and also due to the presence of the solids. Um, and this, is going to lead to subdiffusive scaling behavior. So, you know, if you look at diffusions with porous media, you have all sorts of effects due to subdiffusion. There's also, you know, this burial of the thermal mixing that comes with that, which is basically going to delay um, your kind of equilibrium at large scales. There's a tendency for systems to become trapped at local energy minimum and then have these sort of bursty dynamics, uh, you know, as you stimulate it. Um, which is similar to the bursty dy dynamics that we show in the droplet coalescence example. And if you think, if you look at this Oswald ripening process, which is basically diffusion uh, creating equilibrium between droplets based on the uh, partial pressure, the time scale for equilibrium can be years to decades at geological length scale. So it's really a very slow approach to true equilibrium. So these Haynes jumps, um, just like the droplet example, are causing these jumps in the pressure, right? So if we look at the pressure difference um, across the sample, we see these um, up and down jumps uh, due to isons and rions. So basically your isons are sort of your reversible, pushing the meniscus into a pore throat, and then it sort of makes its way through and jumps into the next one, and you have this pressure drop, and then it sort of works its way into the next range of pore necks and establishes new quasi-static configurations. So with the time average, you're really trying to get rid of these fluctuations in time. So we, we introduced this sort of diffusive length scale that's defining our, our, our ergodic length scale. And what we wanted to do was come up with, with a way to test whether or not this criteria was actually, you know, indicating that the, that the dynamics was er, were ergodic. So th these experiments that I'm looking at were, were ones that um, Stefan Berg had, had done in 2013. And he always had this thing that uh, he thought that two-phase flow was ergodic. And we wanted to figure out a way to quantitatively test it. So we took this diffusive length scale and we used that to determine basically this yellow region where we think the behavior should be ergodic. And then if, if, uh, if the dynamics are moving mass faster than this uh, diffusive mechanism, then, then we would call this sort of ergodicity breaking. And you do see this for Haynes jumps 
So, you know, it kind of does sort of come together in that way. Now, if you waited longer, right, it should become ergodic, right? So we could just sort of move sort of horizontally, wait a longer amount of time. And these particular Haynes jumps, you know, the, the energy should basically equal partition if we just wait longer. The problem arises if you have a hierarchy of light scales and you can't wait forever, right? So if you have a porous material, there's a really wide range of length scales and, and you can't easily nail down how long do you need to wait. You can't just take an individual Haynes jump and say, well, we're going to wait, you know, a second and everything will be well mixed. So at the small scale though, right? The hands jumps are not affecting it if you go to a spatial scale that's sort of sufficiently small. It's going to mix quickly at small scales. So if we integrate the energy conservation equation, and I already dealt with this DUDT term previously um, with the fluctuations earlier, um, we're just adding other, other conservation terms for energy. So this is just a standard conservation en of energy you know, form with the uh, with no body sources of heat. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna apply the Gauss divergence theorem to, to identify the energy inputs through the boundary, right? And if these are zero, then that will be satisfied in a case where the net rate of energy inputs is zero to the system. And if we're doing an experiment on the sample, we should be able to control this, right? We should be able to create a, an experimental situation with a net rate of energy being put into the system is zero. So if you're doing work on the system, sort of got to come out as heat. It doesn't matter if you have, you know, sort of some energy coming in as, you know, like pressure volume work and some energy leaving as heat, that should be okay, as long as energy isn't accumulating in the system. So if we can construct an experiment that way, this term is zero, and the extensive variables here are also going to be zero. So the fluctuations can contribute, but they'll cancel, right? So they, they, or, well, they may cancel. They may also couple the mechanical modes. But the, um, the net rate of entropy production and then the number of molecules and the total internal energy will be zero, just like it was for the Carnot cycle. So we'll just choose lambda to be big enough that this is true. Now, in terms of the homogenization, we, we define our average velocity and pressure, um, and then we basically just integrate it to define average forms, and you get this sort of flux force product, and then you get this mechanical deviation term. So the mechanical deviation term is this u, u prime dot grad p, um, and this is you know, just basically some uh, effects due to these bursty dynamics. Uh, that, uh, you know, are sort of multi-scale effects. So from this, we can derive uh, Darcy's law as long as the fluctuation terms are zero, which I'll return to. So you end up with a flux force perm. You don't get entropy production. So it's a, di a little bit different from what you would traditionally do in non-equilibrium thermodynamics because you're relating the heat uh, to the, the flux force pair instead of the entropy production. And, you know, and so your heat is just determined if you, you know, assume there's a Newtonian stress tensor, um, you can, you know, basically uh, get some inequality um, because this thing's positive, just like you normally would. And you can use that to derive Darcy's law. <clears throat> In the two phase case, you can, the same form holds. The only difference is that instead of integrating over the whole system, we need to integrate over the subregions. And that's gonna divide, what that's gonna do is it's gonna change the definition of the flux. So your, your U, uh, the term that would be your, your total flow rate gets divided between the water flow rate and the um, oil flow rate. And these are just, they're spatial subsets. You could also subset it by mass, right? If you wanted to. But in this case, they're, they're spatial subsets and, and, but you get the same thing on the right-hand side. For this to hold, right, to get this multiphase extension of Darcy's law, we get a fluctuation constraint. And the fluctuation constraint has a, a, mechanical fluct, um, a mechanical contribution due to U prime dot grad P and a thermodynamic uh, contribution due to the 
uh, the thermodynamic deviation terms. And you can obtain the relative permeability relationship as long as this thing's zero. So what we wanna do is just evaluate this from simulations. And, it, and note that it doesn't have to hold microscopically, meaning the integrand doesn't have to be zero. It just has to cancel if we consider a long enough time. So our, our, our knob that we can turn is the, the time interval lambda, because if we look at a long enough time interval, this should really become ergodic and, and those terms should cancel each other. We can also, using the same approach, derive cross-coupling terms if we also break up the pressure, right? And so if we take that grad of uh, Vp, which is the porosity times the pressure, we can break this into a term where we have the pressures for each subregion. And in this case, you're going to get a cross-coupling form. But this is really a modeling choice. So what we see from this is that you can derive the standard relative, pre uh, relative permeability if the driving force is the total pressure gradient. If you want to use the pressure gradients within each fluid, then you have to have a cross-coupling form, which is something that's been showed by uh, a number of authors you know, over the years. And, and that's really the distinction, I think, and probably the main thing that you learn from, from this study other than uh, studying the, the fluctuations is that you can derive standard relative permeability uh, based on a, a appropriate driving force. So here's the simulations we're gonna consider. Uh, we have two different wetting conditions and a few um, you know, sort of different saturation values. Uh, so the, the time axis is showing basically how things are fluctuating. So you can see that depending on the wetting condition and depending on the, um, the saturation, you get different fluctuation profiles. And some of these, you get quite a bit more fluctuations than others but they're mostly uh, going to be stationary processes. And if they're not stationary, we can also test that. So this is also, it's capillary number one to the minus five. So it's a low capillary number case. First, the, top, the topology is a key problem you solve by doing a time average, because instead of getting discontinuities, what you get is something like a topological residence time, basically how much time does the fluid spin in a particular connectivity state? So even if there's all sorts of dynamic connectivity going on, uh, you can determine how important they are relatively uh, based on how much time the system spends in a particular state. You see that you know, in a number of cases, you get multiple peaks uh, because you have different metastable fluid configurations that, the, the, the path, you know, that, are, that are sort of dominant at different times. So you might have one sort of connected pathway for a little while, and then that breaks down for some reason and another one forms. And if you look at a long enough time scale, it should sort of alternate back between these various metastable states, but they're gonna cause sort of weird distributions um, based on the fact that, you know, there are, you know, you know, sort of particular states that are gonna be favored. So, for pressure fluctuations, and we ran a bunch of these to try to get a sense. So sometimes if you run a fast simulation, you can get things that don't have mean zero. You can get things that have multiple peaks. But I do think it's true that if you run a long enough simulation, you, you can get a pressure that's somewhat close to Gaussian. It's also true that if you add the two pressure values together, just like in the droplet coalescence case, they'll tend to cancel each other a lot. So you'll get a narrower distribution uh, when you consider the total sort of pressure fluctuation as opposed to just looking at the fluctuations in oil or the fluctuations in water. You also have to consider this, the surface energy, um, which you know, is you know, when a Haynes jump happens, for example, your pressure does work again in, into the surface energy and then that can come back out when the surface energy does work against the pressure. Um, so you have to think about that energy piece. Um, and then the uh, mechanical fluctuation term, this U prime dot grad P, uh, ends up being potentially the most interesting quantity of, of, of the ones we're looking at here, um, at least for this simulation. So you, you see cases where you have different peaks. And the idea is that this is probably accounting for those Haynes jumps that are associated with transitions between different connectivity states um, you know, during the displacement. 
Now, comparing stationary to non-stationary, um, the case on the left shows something that would be, you know, basically a stationary case where the fluctuations are canceling so that there's no net contribution to the energy dynamics from these extra terms. The case on the right shows where well, you have one slow time scale process, and this is from this velocity deviation term, and the net contribution is the green dashed line, and you can see it's about, uh, you know, maybe 10% of, of the total, um, you know, basically the, the work that's done, you know, according to the relative permeability coefficient. So that would essentially be a level of certainty, uh, you know, on your, uh, on your relative permeability coefficient. It would be like an REV uncertainty, right? Because it's, uh, it's telling you how much of the energy that you think is dissipated is actually potentially in these sort of fluctuating modes where you don't know where that en energy would end up over the longer time scale. So your only real option there, if you're interested in a valid coefficient or, or a more accurate coefficient is to look at it over a longer time scale. So um, in the summary, right, of the general idea, we're using this Einstein relationship to try to define um, what scale um, is our system ergodic at based on the measurement. So like take a pressure measurement and it's averaged over a second. How big is that you know, pressure measurement kind of capturing, right? Same with temperature. Um, energy barriers are gonna you know, slow down thermal diffusion. And so we kind of wanna assume that our ergodic scale is smaller than the length scale for our heterogeneity. As long as there aren't nonlinearities within the, the scale where we have an ergodic assumption, we should be okay. So based on this, we define this proposed ergodicity test, which seems to make sense. And, and it's probably the case that we need to be able to consider large spatial scales without assuming that the er ergodicity holds at those scales, at least for a lot of the problems that we care about. Of course, in this talk, some of the problems aren't really resolved, like because we can identify the time scale, but if things are happening faster, right, you're, you know, you've still got to come up with some clever way uh, to deal with that. For two phase flow, um, you know, I think the situation is, is, is as follows. So capillary pressure hysteresis is almost entirely explained based on geometry. Basically, the Minkowski functionals predict. Um, what happens with capillary pressure. For relative permeability, if you choose the driving force, you can get the standard form. And if you wanna work with an extended relative permeability thing that has an advantage, you could derive this also. However, for the dynamic capillary pressure, basically what happens when saturation is changing, the situation is quite a bit more difficult because you can't, you can't just look at a longer time scale when you have a displacement with its own sort of intrinsic time scale. So those, those capillary pressure dynamics are, uh, I think it's, it's just a harder problem. And I don't think that, that there are good solutions to this problem at present. Uh, so it's something where I think there's gonna have to be some additional effort to really nail down what the appropriate theory would be. So um, with that, I wanna thank my collaborators and, and uh, some of you are on this list. I've had a, a number of very interesting discussions um, with, with you on these. And so I really appreciate those and uh, hopefully there will be more. And uh, with that, I'm happy to take any questions or, or anything. Then uh, Florence, I have a question. question. If I don't know if he hears me. I hear you. Ah, okay. Well, nice talk. I listen with interest. But I do have, of course, many questions. But let me start this one. Take the Einstein relation that tells you basically that you can get the diffusion coefficients by following the velocity, say, of a particle or the displacement. Now, uh, of course, uh, the velocity autocorrelation function has been studied a lot. And in fact, one finds that it has a lot of complex behavior as a function of the time called like long time uh, problems in this correlation function of the velocity. 
Now, uh, the way you understand that is uh, you can actually go back to the expression Stokes gave for the friction coefficient of particles, which is frequency dependent. Now, how, in fact, in what you are telling us, do you address frequency dependence of the uh, kind of coefficients that you are measuring? So I haven't done anything to look at frequency dependence at this scale. Um, we've done, we've looked at frequency dependence at the, um, you know, I guess at the sort of Darcy scale. Now, a lot of the work that I'm doing, you know, is with lattice Boltzmann methods. And one of the limitations there is that you have a minimum time scale. And because you're, you're basically assuming that there's a relaxation to the Maxwell Boltzmann kind of distributions that's happening over a time scale, which means that any kind of frequency character that's inherently molecular in nature isn't in the model, right? So that could be in experimental data, but it's not something that I can resolve in, in this approach because it's sort of abstracted away. But now, if you have any resonances in the system, you are saying that I should measure long enough so that they do not matter. Yes, and the idea I think for resonances is, is that if there was a molecular resonance, right, the time scale, basically the frequency is going to depend on the spatial scale for the motion, right? Mm -hmm. And a molecular resonance should have a faster time scale than, than things with, you know, that are associated with a larger length scale heterogeneity. So, you know, what you're really trying to do is separate this, you know, sort of you're trying to say there's a molecular scale, and then there's a continuum scale in between the molecular scale and the system you want to describe. And you're going to deal with ergodicity between the molecular scale and the continuum scale, and then just integrate to get to the bigger scale. Does that make sense? Well, yeah, I understand what you say, but these phrases that way. Yeah, and uh, it's the thing I would like to discuss. But if, if you are coming here, that's going to be a great opportunity. I, I hope so, because I've been, I've actually been working a little bit on trying to do the, some uh, ion transport modeling with these, and I would be really interested in talking with, 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 with you about these, because I know you've worked on them before, because um, those have some other kind of challenges with them, for sure, and, and um, it could be really, and, and the scale issues, I think, are in some sense less clear. <laughs> because of the screening in the systems. Yeah. So. Thank you. All the questions? Do we have some uh, questions online? I have. Hey, Oslo, can you hear us? Yes. I can hear you. Okay. Yeah, this is Terry Rickwald in Oslo. I had just had a detailed question about your uh, Maxwell Demon. Mm. And you seem to you have some uh, damped oscillations there. Are those sound waves or yes? So, yeah, that with those uh, those types of. So these these basically they come up from solving this set of equations. So there's a paper that we published in Physical Review E here where we include this example, and there's actually a Python code attached to that i think it's in the supporting materials if not just send me an email if you're interested in it but basically you are defining a, an algorithm to execute this what this demon is doing um and you're just sort of solving you know what the entropy and the temperature and the pressure are from the state functions and then there's a certain so this bullet that's noted that's labeled evolution of the system right when the demon opens the gate, it's it's letting some molecules across. And so you've got a rule basically for how it's sort of discriminating against slow particles. And then you've got an energy exchange. And the energy that's exchanged is based on, you know, the molecules it lets across. And the particles and energy that one part that one chamber gains, the other one loses. So that's where you're getting your, your symmetry, right? So the the idea is when you subdivide a system, the way that the discontinuity is introduced is based on the fact that you're sort of 
putting one particle into another place, right? So, but these, these oscillations here are just obtained by executing this model and sort of basically turning on the demon and then turning it off, you know, to see, you know, that it goes back to its original state. Uh, so it's just, a, it's just solving these equations. But does that mean that it's essentially an artifact or? No, because if you look at the entropy here, right, the, the entropy is going, the wrong way, right? So the second law of thermodynamics is definitely violated. Um, and I, I was sort of a skeptic about this until, you know, I, um, I was talking to a, a physicist at Virginia Tech, who's Uwe Tauber, um, mm -hmm. and he pointed this out, basically, that this is a real problem. You know, if you have like a biological system, like where you have, say, proteins that are behaving in strange ways, basically, because they can potentially take fluctuations and then segregate, you know, information, you know, in very non-intuitive ways. And so, you know, the example was a little bit of a test to see if we could deal with that or see what the problem is. Of course, you know, I do think that, you know, it's a non-equilibrium situation. It's not an equilibrium, you know, setting and, and really what the demon is doing is it's using the fluctuations and postponing the the kind of equilibrium you know state you know it's not preventing it or you know really violating any core problem other than the fact that it's slowing things down do you have spatial resolution and the gases on each side no, I, I, that seemed like overkill, but that's the right way to think about it. And I think that the constraint that that would impose here is basically that the rate that it lets molecules across has to be slow compared to the diffusive time scale in the system, right? If it, you know, if it was bursty, right, then you'd end up with gradients and you'd have to resolve them. And, and we didn't go to that step. But certainly it would be reasonable to do so, especially if there was not time scale separation. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Very nice talk. Thank you. And good questions. <laughs> Say hello to my friends in the physics department. Uh, okay. Who do you know here? We've got some, we've had some very good discussions in this, yeah, no, in this okay. off physics group. I know everybody, of course, uh, Royce and Bout have since disappeared, but uh, Uwe is there. Yeah, it's a, it, there's, there's some good uh, new faculty too. The, 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 yeah. I, most experimental people put there. Yeah. Good yeah. Place. Okay, are there more questions online? Uh, not here either, and I think we might uh, might wrap up the session. So uh, thanks a lot, uh, James, for a very nice talk, and uh, with plenty of uh, things to think about for I guess all of us. And uh, we certainly hope that you will be able to uh, come here and physically in the spring. So I thanks a lot. I hope so too. Thanks so much, Mike. Yeah.